Hello, everyone. My name is Neil Stokes, and I am a librarian with the Los Angeles Public Library. And today we have a really great program with Master Gardener Yvonne Sav Savio. And uh, we're going to be learning today about how to create your own container garden. So Yvonne, thanks for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to you. OK, very good. Thank you, Neil. Hi, everybody. Uh, I used to run the Master Gardener program for Los Angeles County, it's part of the University of California, and uh, for some 20 years. And consequently, I was able to visit a lot of container gardenings, uh, gardens in Southern California. And I created this PowerPoint to be able to show you a lot of examples and also some real tips about how to approach the whole idea of container gardening for the greater success that you can manage. A lot of gardening is just matching the plant to the size of the container as a result of how large or how small that root zone is. For example, you'll see here, um, this is a tomato plant and this container is probably two feet deep and about two feet wide because if you will give enough water and fertilizer to your tomato plant its roots could go down three feet in the regular soil whereas these little things like perhaps some ch um, chives here this is only a six inch pot and it really doesn't need much more than that because the roots if you put them in a big container like this, they would still only go down about four or five inches. So this slide here is a nice example of matching the plants and their root zones to the containers. However, you do need to be aware of where you are planting your container um, and what kind of sun and the amount of sun because especially as we start getting into our hot weather, uh, these containers are going to be drying out very quickly every day. So especially ones that are only less than a foot deep, and certainly this one is up on its legs, um, those are going to dry out so that you might have to water them twice a day. And this means every day that it gets really hot. So sometimes you want to utilize a much deeper container just so that you won't have to be always out there doing the watering. So why and why not should you utilize a container? And of course, everything in life, there are advantages and disadvantages. So see which ones match best according to your particular garden. The advantages on a patio or a balcony or a fence or steps, you can put a container anywhere, literally. It can move per the seasons to either follow or avoid the direct sun. You can move them for your own enjoyment, like when it's blooming or fruiting and flowering and just looking beautiful. Especially if it's um, a plant more like this that is just kind of a plain green. You really would like to have it when it has some nice special um, blooming and coloring on it. The last really major advantage is that you can create a special soil mix, like when you are growing blueberries or orchids or something that you really are not going to be successful if you just put it into the regular ground or use a regular kind of generic planting mix. So some disadvantages. You have a captive plant. Those roots are completely restricted to the container itself. And it is sensitive to the weather, whether it's really hot or really cold or it's windy, whatever it is. It can't escape. Consequently, 
you'll more likely have to frequently irrigate it and fertilize it and also prune the roots and repot it after at least two or three years because the plant just has kept developing and now it's crowding out all of the potting mix. So what type of container? You do need to have drainage holes in the pot or else put a pot in a pot. For example, this is a quite a large pot and this little rose bush here may be in a smaller pot that is planted inside here, utilizing some peat moss or potting mix uh, or anything between the two pots so that it is a pot within a pot, but that is for more insulation value because then the heat and the cold and all that can't get inside in order to damage the plant. The size of the pot is particularly important, especially when you want to have it deeper rather than wider. You want it deeper because that is going to be where the roots will go down rather than wider. Now let me go back to that first slide. You see this is deeper and these containers are wider. This provides more space for evaporation and consequently you will have to water it more frequently rather than these deeper pots which because of gravity the water goes all the way down and then the roots chase the water and it's much cooler down there as well. So it makes for a much more successful growing of that particular plant. So material and color are the next two elements. If it's a darker pot, it's going to absorb the heat. Now this can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing, depending on the season and how generally you want that plant to be able to live. The color, um, like a dark color, um, the material is going to be whether, like this one is a ceramic and it is glazed on the outside, this coloring, and consequently that is going to have very little evaporation only through the top here, which is going to be the potting mix. A clay, this is a clay pot. If you use a plastic pot, it will hold a little bit of the moisture in there. It will not um, allow much evaporation, but it is going to heat up and cool down much more quickly than this heavy clay pot will. Now hanging baskets, we've got this great example here of all these little teapots hanging from the uh, railing going down and also these clogged shoes which are perfect drainage of course. Um, you really do have to match the plant to the pot. In this case, this has some geraniums and other things in there that do um, require great drainage. And these containers, hopefully they do have a drainage hole in them. Otherwise, as you keep watering with these, they would fill up with water and it would drown the plant. And of course, this I thought was just too cute. Taking your garden with you. Now this is my collection of succulents that I had just repotted and tried to match the plant with the pot, both in terms of the size and the depth in order to accommodate the root zone. So some of the plants are very tiny, some of them are much larger and larger and even larger. How much sun do you need to give your plants that are in containers? 
it's like in the regular when you are planting in the garden itself. If you just want the foliage, in other words, it's not going to put out any flowers or any fruit, but just grow the green foliage. You need at least six hours of sun, direct sun daily. That means on a sunny day, you can see that it's in the sun for six hours at least. If it's going to be growing flowers and fruit, for example, the flowers on this bougainvillea or on a fruit tree or squash or tomatoes, those are all fruits. And because the plant has to not only grow the foliage, but it has to go ahead and grow flowers and then some of those will be pollinated and they'll turn into fruit. Those have to have at least eight hours of direct sun every day. Now on a day when it's a little foggy or something, that's not going to be a concern, but just so that they are in a spot that if it was going to be completely sunny that day, they would be getting more than eight hours of sun. That's just because they have to go through that additional growth of not only the plant for the foliage, but also the flowers and then the fruits. So those of you who have grown tomatoes, you know that you spend all that time looking at the plant just getting larger and larger. And then there's a point at which it puts out its blossoms and then if those blossoms get pollinated, it may be another two months before you are able to eat those tomato fruits. So that's why the plant needs to have that extra amount of sun every day. And also we'll talk a little later about the amount of irrigation and fertilization. Now bright shade is what house plants can um, survive very nicely with outdoors. Like if you have a tree um, or even just a large shrub that you could tuck a couple of plants underneath in their containers just so they get some fresh air. And so bright shade means that it never has the sun directly shining on it or maybe just a little bit of filtered sun. You know, as the sun is moving through the leaves of a tree, um, it kind of scatters its direct sun onto the plant. But bright shade means that it's got lots of light, but none of it is direct sun. Isn't this begonia fun? This is called an escargot because it's got the curl like a snail. So what kind of potting mix do I use when I'm uh, planting in containers? You never want to use real dirt from your garden if you do have a regular garden. It has inevitably, it has disease spores in it, it has weed seeds in it, and it's just really heavy compared to potting mix. Do use a high quality sterilized soil-less mix that has lots of organic ingredients in it. And mostly it'll say potting mix or potting soil. And it will have all these, uh, you look in the ingredients, it'll have uh, fern and bark and all sorts of organic kinds of mixture in it. But it will be very fine grain like this. Now also it can have some of the little white or silvery kinds of bits in it, which are vermiculite or mica. And those are um, organic, they do belong in the mix and they help hold the water and also release the water. Now you want to fill the container. Um, let me back up a little bit. What I don't have written here is covering the holes 
at the bottom of the container. You want to use like a little piece of window screen. Um, you can buy it at a hardware store as if you're going to replace a window and then cut it into pieces that are maybe three inches square. Put that down on top of the hole first and then um, you can use a piece of a broken pot or just go ahead and put the potting mix in then. But having that piece of window screening there is going to keep the potting mix from coming out of the hole every time you water. So next is filling the container with the potting mix. You do want to leave about an inch. This is an estimate about an inch of once you plant your plant in here, you need to have about an inch after you've compressed the potting mix around the root zone of the new plant because you want to be able to fill this with water each time you water it. Now, after the plant has been in there a little bit, maybe a, several months, if you find that the water is going to the outer rim and going down and never getting into the bulk of the potting mix, then you do need to take a, um, a little fork or a tool and just turn all this soil here down to about an inch because what's happening is that the water is going to the edges and around the edges and out of the hole and it's not watering all of this potting mix. So what can I plant? In vegetables, you've got tomatoes, you've got lemongrass, you've got little baby peas. These are only like eight inches, and yet you get peas. Here is a very shallow, about a six foot, I'm sorry, six inch uh, raised bed, and it's got several kinds of lettuces, um, and even a tomato at the back here. Now this is an odd container. This was at a community garden, and they had the edging of the raised bed. We're utilizing these concrete construction blocks. And the person turned it so that this hole goes straight down and they planted two leaks in there. So the leak does just fine because you can imagine how hot this is concrete is going to get during our summer. But the leak is going to do just fine in there. And also because the soil mix is a little bit down from the edge, it has a corralled space for the water to go in there. Now here's how you can construct rain gutters into an everlasting growth space for lettuces. Here there's a faucet and it goes into this big bin here, like a watering trough. It, is pumped up to the top one here. And then the water goes down through each rain gutter, all planted with different lettuce plants, all the way down to the bottom, and then it goes back into the bucket. Isn't that creative? That's just the greatest thing, I think. What can I plant in terms of fruit bushes, fruit trees, and ornamental trees? Now this is a grape bush. This was at a community garden. However, it was planted before this awning was put over the top. And the problem is that now this grape bush gets absolutely no direct sun. And consequently, it makes a very nice green plant, but it never puts out any blossoms and never provides any grapes. So it's a nice ornamental, but again, you need to grow it 
in a space according to whether it needs the six hour minimum or more than eight hours of direct sun. Now this is a kumquat tree. It has little tiny, um, about an inch size fruits on it. And it's in a good size container. <clears throat> However, at the very base, they have a selection of succulents here to fill in the space so that there's really not much space for evaporation here at all. But because the roots of the kumquat are mostly down at the bottom half of the pot, and the roots of the succulents are in the top half of the pot, they're not competing for fertilizer and for the irrigation water. So that's a good um, plan to have. You don't want them competing, but you do want all the space to be utilized. Now this plant on the right, this is about a foot and a half and about a foot and a half across. But because the root system on this is pretty tiny, it is okay to keep it in this container. However, if you were going to really want that plant out in the, um, in the garden itself, or it'd really be best to move it to a larger container so that the roots have more space. Flowers. Now this is all the pretty stuff, of course. So we've got begonias, we've got geraniums, bulbs, tulip bulbs in just little teacups, hydrangeas, and this is called moss rose or mini roses. I think these are the mini roses. And then a bromeliad in a pot that makes it look like a hairdo. Now one note about the hydrangeas here. This is on the north side of this particular house and they are in very large containers because you know how bulky hydrangeas can get. But because they do get this bit of morning sun, then they're shaded, protected for the rest of the day. Um, and so they still get that bright shade, which they prefer. So how many plants do, can I put in a container? You do want to fill the space. However, you want to make sure that each plant has enough space for the fertilizer and the irrigation and just to be able to expand to the size that it is supposed to according to its genetics. So what we have here is an artichoke, a baby one, it's um, producing for the first time. And around it, we have uh, opal basil, some green basil, um, some thyme. Uh, here's the thyme and oregano and maybe some of the Thai basil here. This container is probably about 20 inches wide and about 20 inches deep. And that is going to accommodate a artichoke just because it is a perennial. You can get, you know, if you really treat it right and feed it and all that, it could last 15 years in the container or in the ground. So its roots are going to be at the very bottom of the container. And all of these herbs will be in the top maybe six inches, eight inches. So again, like that one that we saw back here, where was it? Here, large plant with a deep root zone 
and smaller plants with a very shallow root zone. So should I use seeds or transplants? You want, of course, because the container is going to be as large as possible and as deep as possible as you can manage, you would like to have it produce a lot of flowers or vegetables. So when it comes to vegetables, you do want seeds that are going to germinate and grow quickly. For example, lettuce. Um, lettuce can come up, now this is in a cool season, time of the year, not so much now. Um, but once we get into fall, like October, um, all the way through, um, say, March and April, you can scatter your lettuce seeds or your radishes, those are beets, radishes, um, and they'll come up in three, four days. Transplants that will take much longer to start from seed, but that do uh, grow very quickly once you've planted them from seedlings, will include eggplant and pepper and tomato and most flowers. And both, of course, you can do for both, which is what I'm trying to exam exemplify here, that I purchased a six pack of lettuce, I planted it, and they're each about a foot apart because that's what the large head will develop into. But at the same time, I scattered some lettuce seed between them. So then these are the plants that I'm going to be eating off of. And then about the time that I'm finished with these, these will have gotten large enough so I can transplant them elsewhere in the garden. So I provided some transplants for immediate growth and eating and the seeds for later on. So some high yield vegetables include beans, beets, broccoli, carrots, lettuces, peppers, radishes, and squashes, and of course, tomatoes. So those are especially the ones that you want to be able to grow in your container because you'll get lots of food off of it for the time and the space that you spend in that growing. So how frequently do I water? The larger, deeper containers moderate soil temperature so you're not out there watering like every 35 minutes, um, like some of those containers that I showed you at the very beginning that are only four or five inches deep during hot weather, you're going to have a real problem on your hands trying to keep those plants happy, or at least just surviving. And of course, you want to do this so that it's going to be a pleasant situation for you, a successful time gardening, not just giving you something else that you have to do every day. So double potting, um, does moderate the soil temperature more. And here's a slight um, variation of that. You have the larger pot at the bottom. You've planted some of the herbs around it. And then you've planted the next smaller size pot, literally right on the potting mix of the bottom level. And then the tinier one on the very top. So what this does is you have all this growing space and you water here, the excess water goes to this one and you water here and it goes down again and then finally it comes out at the very base. But in the meantime, all of this is well uh, irrigated and moist and cooler and that's what's good for the roots to have the cooler temperatures 
Now you can use your finger as a measure. Just stick it right in the top here. And if you um, feel that it is wet up to the first knuckle on your finger, then it's okay to leave it. It's doing just fine. But if your finger is dry to the second knuckle, then it's time to water it right then. Now, there's two cues of the way the plant looks. At the very end of the day, um, many plants are going to look droopy and um, uh, they're not going to have a sheen to it. It's going to be kind of a dull colored surface. This is normal. It's just like you at the end of a day that you've been out in the sun. You're tired. But if by the next morning, those plants are still droopy and they're still dull surface looking, then you know you have to water immediately because it hasn't been able to recoup even over the night. So especially with um, a lawn, um, it's very apparent when it is drooping and dull colored instead of shining. So water very slowly. You know, don't blast it with water in here. You really want to give it enough water so that it can seep in between all these little bits of potting mix in there and then run down. This is something that I had um, uh, given an example of earlier. If the water runs down the inside of the pot, you know, between the pot and the potting mix, that the mix itself is completely dry and it's wasting all of that water. So what you may want to do, especially during the summer now as we're getting into the heat, is put a drip pan underneath the pot. Now this does not have a drip pan. And what you want it is something underneath that's going to catch the excess water, maybe as much as a whole half an inch. And then what will happen as it heats up every day and cools down at night, the pot will reabsorb that water as the plants need it. Now you don't want to have this drip pan in the winter. At least this last winter, we were fortunate enough to have lots of rain, especially January, February, or February, March. And having the pot catch the drip pan underneath, uh, catching all that excess water would just keep it much too moist. But during the summer, it's going to be a very helpful thing for your plants. Fertilizing. The major nutrients, of course, are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Now, on your um, fertilizer bags, there's many combinations, but they're always going to have the three main numbers in that order. The first number is going to be the nitrogen that creates the green foliage. The second number will be the phosphorus, which provides for strong roots. And then the last number will be potassium, which is for generally good growth of the plant and also for fruiting and flowering. You do want to have trace nutrients in the fertilizer that you choose. Um, there are many things that are helpful for plants to grow healthily that are not much, um, well, they're so tiny in proportion that um, it's, it's something that you really want to make sure is there but not a whole lot of it. And so they're called trace nutrients. It's always best to use an organic fertilizer, which perhaps includes fish emulsion, seaweed, kelp, blood meal, and bone meal. 
Um, now, all of those are pretty stinky when they get applied in the garden, but within a day, it's um, you can't tell them anymore, um, especially outdoors. And there are um, new variations of the organic fertilizers that have had the smell taken out of them. So, especially with um, indoor plants, you want to be able to utilize one of those. Now, I recommend that you use a quarter strength every other time you water. Now, you could go an eighth strength every time you water. The whole point is to be able to provide the nutrition for the plants to be able to pick up when they need it. But you don't want to be giving them so much that they end up literally burning the roots of the plant or having that white film around the container. Okay, and this also makes it much easier, at least for me, I have found, if I can always have that mixture made up and I just water every time with that mixture, then I don't have to worry, did I feed it last time or did I? and end up either doubling the dose or something. So for me, it's much easier just to do the same thing every time and to make sure that I'm feeding it um, literally very little along with lots of the water. The other technique is to water a plant first to make sure that all that potting mix is sufficiently moistened and then to go ahead and water, let it sit for like a day just to make sure that all that potting mix is equally moistened and then do another batch of the water with the fertilizer in it. Because then you're guaranteed that that fertilizer is going to be spreading completely within all of that potting mix. Okay. Those are the basics. Now we get to play with some fun containers. So these, those of you who were old enough to remember real coffee cans, that's what all these were. And this person painted them all blue and mounted them on their wall and have a beautiful bouquet all of the time coffee pot or makes a nice terrarium. Here is a hanging lamp that they flipped over and utilize as a planting space for little bits of plants. Logs that were rotted out in the center, they put potting mix and filled them up. Here's oversized cups a beautiful little swan with some succulents in it. Here's a, um, uh, a woven basket. Now this, um, of course, it would rot out immediately unless you line it with the um, plastic and then plant your herbs or whatever else you're going to be having in there. How about a bathtub that gets uh, modernized into the garden or a bureau? Some truck tires. This, of course, you um, can buy these planter blocks at Home Depot and other big box stores. a whole selection of pots. Now remember when your pots are this size, you're gonna to have to be out there watering it pretty frequently. A toolbox, a wheelbarrow, woven bags. This is taking your garden with you for sure. A ladybug out of tires. Some jeans, a succulent gardens, heads, 
shoes. And this, of course, is all of our fantasies about our container gardens. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and it's given you some things to think about relative to what you would like to have in your container gardening. And I see we have one question. Uh, is it okay to have more than one inch of space at the top of the container? Um, yes, of course. Uh, if it's a larger container and it's a large succulent or tree, then perhaps it would be more advisable, advantageous for the plant to be able to have two inches at the top. However, um, you don't want to be wasting the space of the pot, so to speak, by having this huge amount of space on top because it could have been used to be more space for that potting mix and consequently the roots of the plant. So. So Yvonne, um, I think that's all the questions we had. Uh, I wanna thank you for joining us today and thanks to our audience for watching. And uh, please subscribe and uh, click that bell if you're on YouTube or follow us on Facebook and you'll get notifications when we go live in the future. We've got some very interesting programs coming up uh, and we are always open at LAPL.org. Be sure to check out the library's website. We've got a full listing of online events. We've got many, many events happening on several platforms, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and we will See you on one of those upcoming programs. Thank you, Yvonne. Neil, um, yes. might I say that um, I do have my website, which is yes. www.gardeninginla.net. And this has what to do each month. It has, I talk about my Pasadena garden every couple of weeks, exactly what's happening in the garden at that point. Um, there's lots of web links. Um, and you can join, re, um, subscribe to the announcements that I send out, which include job opportunities when they are posted, uh, by emailing me at gardeninla at gmail.com. The website is gardeninla.net. So do email me if you've got a gardening question. I love chatting gardening. Okay. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Neil. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye for now.